Hey, good morning. You may be seated. Kids, you're dismissed. You'll be met in the back. Uh, again, Skylar already said it, but welcome to all of you. Uh, welcome, especially if you're new and you're visiting our church. We're glad you're here this morning. I just, um, man, I was thinking about that song, the prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. And how many of you, uh, that's kind of the narrative of your spiritual life, right? That, that it's a constant battle of, of, Lord, I want to seek you. Uh, but yet, I, I've had moments where I love this world, and I, I love my sin, and I struggle. And hey, that's the beauty of church, isn't it? That when we come here, we come as people with issues, with problems, with brokenness, but we come because the cross of Jesus saves us. And so I want you to know, whoever you are, wherever you're at, if even if you're questioning and not sure, this is the place for you to, to, to come to God, to seek Him, and He's calling you to seek Him. So I'm just glad you're here. Uh, before, uh, before we look at the Word of God, I uh, want to do a, an announcement. Skylar said it, but on Wednesday nights, we're at the San Dimas Farmer's Market. Uh, it's actually right down the street here. And uh, it's right down the street here. And uh, it, it's an awesome opportunity for us just to be a church that's in the community. Uh, a lot of you in this room have come because we met you at the Farmer's Market. So I, I just want to invite you all, if you want to come out, uh, it really starts to pick up between 6 and 8 o'clock every Wednesday night. We'll have a booth there. You don't have to do anything. You just come out and say hi. Or you could just be a friendly face, greet people in the community. Uh, but with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray and we'll look at God's Word together this morning. Heavenly Father, we uh, praise you. And we thank you, just like the, the verses that Kevin just read, that you died for our sake, that you laid your life down on behalf of us. Lord, I, I lift up our world today. I lift up what's happening with Israel and Iran and all of the Middle East, Lord. And we pray uh, that your hand that would be there, that you bring about peace, Lord. We're reminded that we live in a fallen world uh, where there's sin and there's brokenness. And Jesus, we look forward to the day when you return. Lord, I lift up our church. I lift up our preschool. Lord, I thank you for all the young families and the children and the teachers and all that goes on on this campus. And I lift up those kids this week, Jesus, that as their teachers teach them the word, they teach them Bible stories, Lord, that you'd impact their lives. I pray for the kids in children's ministry right now, that at a young age, they'd come to know you. Lord, I praise you for our church. I thank you that we can be here. I thank you you've designed this. And I pray that you'd speak now. In your name we pray. Amen. Man. If you have a Bible, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 24. But as you're turning there, I want you to try to, with me, put yourself in David's shoes or sandals or whatever he was wearing. But, but, but try to step into his life. And my goal is in this is at the end to ask, how are you feeling uh, knowing this? So if you're David and you look past on the, the past few years of your life, it's, it's kind of been a roller coaster. The, the, the highlight that you always think about is that one day, when your brothers uh, said, hey, we need food, we're on the battlefield. And so you were kind of just the, the grocery boy, the Uber Eats, you know, you bring them cheese and sandwiches and you show up on the battlefield and you see all the Israel, the, the armies, the, the, the men of, you know, valor, are, are, they're, they're cowering in fear next to this giant Goliath. And so you walk around, you're a young guy and you're like, hey, what are you guys afraid of? Isn't God on our side? What are you doing here? And they're like, yeah, but have you seen how big Goliath is? I mean, that guy goes to Planet Fitness for sure. He's huge, right? Like, we're not going this. And, and so you're like, okay, but, but God's on our side. And so you go to the king, King Saul, and you say, hey, uh, no one's volunteering to fight Goliath. I'll do it. King Saul looks at you, you know, looks at how big or small you are, and he's basically, you know what he's thinking. Saul's like, if you go out there, you're going to die, but sure, go ahead. Good luck, right? So you go out, you trust the Lord, and what happens? Victory. You handle it, right? And the Lord works through it. It's this amazing moment. And, and you did this, and then right after that, uh, King Saul, he sees that, and he says, okay, you know what, David? That's amazing. Uh, I'm going to bring you into my family. You're going to live with us. You're going to live with us in royalty. Uh, you then go in, and you, you try to serve Saul the best you can. You become best friends with his son, Jonathan. Uh, Saul sometimes gets depressed, so you go in, and you play the harp for him. And you just try to encourage this guy. He promotes you, and he makes you commander over the armies. And you do a good job at that. And everything's gone pretty well in your mind. You've just loved this guy. You've served him. You've been following the Lord. Until one day, something kind of changed. You're playing the harp for Saul. Everything's good. And he throws a spear at you to kill you. And you're like, did I hit a wrong chord? I get something more masculine here, but it's not a harp. Like, what, what was it? Um, but then he does it a second time. 
And then Saul offers you his, wife, his daughter to marry, but he sends you on a suicide mission first. And you go on the suicide mission and you actually don't die, but you come in victory, you marry his daughter. But then Saul sends soldiers to your house and you have to have your wife cover for you as you crawl out the window to hide. Saul's been attacking you and attacking you and attacking you. Uh, he spread lies about you throughout the whole kingdom that you're a traitor. At this point in your life, you've lost everything. You're literally on the run. You're living in a cave. You're homeless. You've lost your career. You've lost your reputation. You're not with your wife. Your family's gone, right? And you are literally cowering in fear because of one man named Saul. Let me ask you this. How are you feeling about Saul. When his name comes to mind, which I'm sure it comes to mind often, how do you feel? Is it anger? Is it rage? Is it sadness? What comes to mind? Because if this guy hadn't turned on you, none of this would happen, and none of it's your fault. Let me ask this. Uh, how do you respond in your own life personally when someone wrongs you? We've all been wronged, right? Some of you have been abused. Some of you have been taken advantage of. Some of you have been scammed, right? You did the Craigslist thing, and they said there was a car, but there wasn't a car. You know, <laughs> things have happened. Not that that's ever happened to me. Um, but you've been through it. You've been through it. What is your knee-jerk reaction when you've been wronged? And I'm talking really wrong. Like, someone knew they were wrong, and they did it. Like, you ever feel that black hole in your soul, right, when you realize people can actually be this evil, this wicked? What do you do? What's your, what's your coping mechanism? Is it that you get really angry? Is it that you want revenge? You go talk trash about them? Uh, you, you just want to get them back anyway? Uh, wh where do you go in your mind? Well, like some of you, you go binge watch stuff, or you eat a gallon of, you know, Hagen dazs ice cream. Like, what is your coping mechanism when someone wrongs you? And, and the thing is, in today's society, it's perfectly okay and acceptable when someone wrongs you for you to wrong them back, isn't it? Like, like, people don't question, like, we watch movies all the time uh, about these soldiers or warriors. You know, someone kills your dog, and it's okay to go kill 500 bad guys because someone killed your dog, right? That you can get revenge, and that's totally fine. And we praise that. We watch MMA fighters, right, where they get in this thing, if I hate you, I'm going to get revenge, and we're like, yeah, we're going to stand behind you. It's perfectly socially acceptable because as long as they did it first, you're justified. You ever felt that? Here's the thing. That mindset has been around forever, throughout humanity. This is how people think. But one day there was a guy named Jesus who stood up and he taught a group of people and he said something really different. Matthew 5, 43. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. So Jesus is saying, hey, this is what society says. This is the norm. This is what we all think. He says, you know this. Everyone says, of course we know that. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Turn it upside down. It's one of the hardest things in the world to do. And I think a lot of us, we've heard that verse, we understand it, but we have excuses in our head. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah I'm going to love my neighbor, but what if they do this? What if it's really bad? What if they never change? i got to let them know they're doing wrong so that they'll change, so therefore I can mistreat them, right? Or you don't know how wrong it was, or you don't know my background, you don't know what I've been through, so I can act the way I act. We come up with excuses even though we know the text. And so today, um, how do you treat those who mistreat you? Is it just self-defense? How do you handle it? We're going to look at David has a moment where he can have revenge and we're going to see what he does and learn from it. So 1 Samuel 24, verse 1. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goats' rocks. He came to the sheepfolds, by the way. There was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. If you don't know what that means, that means going to the restroom. Now, David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave, and the men of David said to him, Here is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Now, it's a very beautiful and exciting text because it shows that people in the Bible use the restroom just like we do. Um, no, but, but, but imagine this situation. Imagine this moment. You're, you're, you're hiding out in the restroom, David and your guys, and then a guy walks in. 
And you get word, one of the guys is like, hey, a guy's coming. They're like, okay, what, what's he doing? Looks like he's using the restroom. That's where you sleep, David, right there. Where he's using, you know, there, he's using it. And they're like, okay, all right, fine. He's using the restroom. Then one of the guys comes to you and says, hey, I think it's Saul. And you're like, wait, first off, why are you watching him to use the restroom and to begin with? But, but second, how do you know it's Saul? He's like, I just, I just think it's Saul. And if there ever was a moment where it would seem like God's giving someone into your hand to kill them, it's this, isn't it? Right? He's sitting there reading a magazine, doing his thing, and you got the, the draw on him. Like, this is the chance. And that's like, David, this is it, buddy. You're going to strike him dead. And imagine if you were David, what would be going through your mind? All the wrongs that have been done to you. This is the final moment. Like, talk about the revenge. Like, maybe I'll, I'll crawl behind him and I'll say, hey, do you need more teepee? And then, whoosh, you know, like, how, how am I going to do it? That's what I'd be thinking. How am I going to kill this guy? But look at what David does. Then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. See, how it happened most of the day is people wore robes. You went to the restroom, you take off a robe, place it over here, go use the restroom, then go put your robe back on. So David goes to the robe, cuts off a piece. But isn't that kind of anticlimactic? Imagine the guys in the cave. Um, David, what are you, what are you doing? I, I didn't, like, I, I said, cut off his head, not his robe. Like, like, what are you thinking right now? But then it gets weirder. Verse 5. Afterwards, David's heart was struck because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. Now, if there's ever a missed opportunity, wouldn't it seem like that? I mean, because here's his guys, um, they're following David, which means that if Saul catches them, what's going to happen to them? This is Saul, right? In the weeks past, what have we read? That, that even the priests, when they helped David, not knowing at that point that David was Saul's enemy, so they were completely innocent, what does Saul do to the priests? He kills all of them and their families. This guy's a loose cannon. He, he's bloodthirsty, right? I mean, he, he's, he's killing people on the verge. He's hunting them. And so they know, David, if you don't kill him now, chances are that he's going to find us later. He's not only going to kill us, but probably our families too. There's this pressure, there's this moment, and the question is, why on earth, David, did you not take the opportunity? It was right there. It was the moment. Let's look at verse 8. Afterward, David also arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, my lord the king. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face towards the earth and paid homage. David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of men who say, behold, David seeks you harm? Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today in my hand in the cave, and some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, see the corner of your robe in my hand, for by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. Now, this is an embarrassing moment for Saul. You walk out, you don't realize you're wearing a mini skirt, and all your soldiers see you. David comes behind you, all your soldiers realize, like, hey, you just used the restroom, and your arch enemy watched you do it, cut off your rope. This is an embarrassing moment. But David comes out and he says, Saul, look, I didn't kill you, but I could have. But still, why? Because even by David doing this, remember, Saul has 3,000 men at his disposal, David has four to 600 men hiding with him. So, odds are, David exposes himself, they're going to get killed. What's he doing? Why is he doing this? Verse 11. I have not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you. But my hand shall not be against you. As the Proverbs of the ancients say, out of the wickedness comes wickedness. But my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out, and after whom do you pursue? After a dead dog, after a flea. May the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you, and see to it, and plead my cause, and deliver me from your hand. Now this raises a question that all the David's soldiers would have asked, and I think what we would ask the same thing is, would it really have been sin to kill Saul? Because he drew first blood, didn't he? 
And wouldn't this be self-defense? I mean, self-defense is okay, right? I mean, someone comes into your house and uses your restroom without asking. I mean, that's self-defense, right? You don't know who they are. And he's been pursuing to kill you. So therefore, I mean, it just seems like, what is the problem? And see, this actually raises some questions that I think all of us ask in our lives is, is how do I deal with people who mistreat me? And am I justified to sin? Am I, am I justified to try to get justice? Or do I really have to forgive them? What does this look like? And so what I want to do is from this answer three questions, three large questions that I think we have when people mistreat us. And I'm hoping the text is going to answer. And the first question is this, can I justify my sin? Can I justify my sin? And you're like, well, that's a basic question. Of course not. But don't we do this all the time? We do, right? Someone wrongs me. Therefore, you need to understand, I only do what I did because they did this. You ever done that before? I only did what I did because they, they started it, and you don't understand who they are. And so David here, you think he would have been able to say this, but, but he says some weird things. He says, the Lord's anointed. Now, back in the day, Saul did not become king because he was a really good lawyer or a really good businessman. He didn't campaign for it. He didn't know the right people and kind of smoothed his way into politics or whatever. None of that happened. He was just doing his thing. God sent Samuel the priest to go handpick Saul and anoint his head with oil and say, you are God's chosen person to be over the nation. That's a big deal. David understood that because David himself experienced that because God has anointed him now. And so he's at this place of like, okay, I, I, I want to respect that position. Now, a side note for us today um, the President of the United States is not picked by a pastor, right? It's not like we have a great pastor that God says, I'm going to send you to go hand pick. Like, that doesn't happen. Um, they're elected officials. But, but let me read this verse in Romans 13, 1. It's not on the screen, but just listen. It says this, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. That's a fun verse, isn't it? For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. You see, I, I think we need to be careful as Christians that, that even if you don't like the current president, even if you don't like the last president, even if you don't like the next president, um, we're in a country where, where you can vote for or against them, and that's a good thing. We're in a country where you can even impeach a president, right? Or, or a governor. You can vote or stand, you can even verbally say, I stand against what they stand for. That's not wrong. But I think where we veer off is as Christians, when we start attacking the person and removing the dignity that they're made in the image of God and making fun of them, right, and attacking them personally. See the difference there? So I'm not saying you can't say, I fundamentally disagree with what this governor or person is doing. But I do think as a believer, you have to be at a place of, hey, all people are created in the image of God and are deserving of respect and honor. And I'm called to honor people. See what I'm saying? I think as a society, we can get really sidetracked with that. And so here, David, Saul is a terrible king, literally horrible. And yet there's a level of respect. There's a level where he says, hey, you know what, Saul, you may be trying to wrong me, but I'm not going to return that with wickedness. I'm not going to go down that road. I'm not going to go on that side of the street. And see, there is never a scenario in Scripture where you can justify your sin even if you've been wronged. Never think. You see, Sarah and I, uh, we, you know, revenge is a strong word. That I, I think a lot of times we think of revenge as it's like, you know, Rambo going to kill somebody or whatever, or king someone's car and singing a country song to it or whatever. You know, like we think of that. And those are extremes. But see, revenge sometimes can be much more subtle, can it? And, and so Sarah and I, we do this dance. And I'm not talking about just dancing on a dance floor. But what it is, and we're working on it, right? Uh, we've been working on it for a long time. But what happens is, if, if Sarah hurts my feelings, okay, th th then I will let her know that she hurt my feelings. And oftentimes, because she's a mature, godly person, she'll say, hey, I'm sorry. Will you forgive me, right? And I'll say, yes, I forgive you. But I know at this point, I have a little power in the relationship because my feelings are hurt. And so I can be a little bit more short, pout a little bit more, don't have to do as thorough on the dishes, because after all, I'm hurt, right? You did the offense, and so the ball, it's, it's kind of, I can act how I kind of want, right? But the, the thing is, is if I go too far, then she gets hurt, 
right? And guess what happens then? Now I apologize, ask forgiveness, but now she has the ball to be like, well, now I'm going to be a little bit more distant and a little bit more because I'm hurt. You guys are really worried about our marriage at this point, aren't you? <laughs> But, but I think, and we go back and forth, and what it is, is it's a form of, you hurt me, I hurt you. You did this to me, I want to get back at you, right? And you go back and forth. And, and I'm guessing it's not just us that, that struggle with this, right? We do this all the time. In relationships with your boss, with your siblings, with your parents, with your significant other, with your friends. That, that we feel justified, well, you lied about me, well, I'm going to lie to you. Okay, you talk bad about me, I'm going to talk bad about you. you. You talk trash on social media, I'm going to talk trash on social media about you. Oh, oh, okay, you didn't invite me here, well, I'm not going to invite you here. And this sounds childish, but we do it all the time, don't we? And we totally feel utterly justified because, well, they did it first. So the Word of God says, that's not how it works. Romans 12, 17 says this, repay no one. Now, what does no one mean? Absolutely no one, right? No one, right? Not, well, what if they hurt me first? Well, what if they're kind of a jerk? Well, what if they're totally oblivious and he never meets my needs or whatever like that? It says, repay no one, what? Evil for evil. But give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with who? All. All people. Even the people that have wronged you. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, what? Feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. How many of us live that out? It's a hard call. It's a hard thing, especially, and I get it, when you're hurt, because people do stuff wrong. And I think what we do is we get so, uh, you know, focused on my feelings and to protect myself in a way of protection, we get big, don't we? Well, I've got to lash out, or i got to be on the offense, or other of you, you hurt me, so I'm just going to stonewall. And I'm out. You talk to me like that, I'm gone, right? I'm going to do my own thing. I'm totally shut off to you, no matter how long, right? Because you hurt me. Word of God says, hey... That's revenge. That's not returning good. That's returning evil for evil. Look at 1 Peter 3.9. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For this you are called that you may obtain a blessing. 1 Thessalonians 5.15. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. We've got to be careful because we live in a society that does not adhere to this. How many of you have sought advice from friends at work or in the neighborhood about your significant other, about your family situation, about the other person that works at your place, and, and those friends that aren't Christian, they totally don't get this. They say, oh, you know what? If they're like that, that sounds abusive to me. Get out. They're horrible. They deserve it. They have it going. I can't believe this. Just, just forget them, right? And that's exactly it. David's guys, they're, they're not the most noble Christian guys, right? And so they're like, David, get him back. Because that's a knee-jerk response of a sinful heart. Where David, his heart is sensitive. Like it says, his heart struck him where he says, no, I want to be sensitive to the Word of God. I want to be sensitive to what the Holy Spirit is saying to me. Do you have that sensitivity in your heart? That you're reminded, even when hurt, even when wronged, uh, what God calls us to. Is it grounded upon the Word of God? So can you justify your sin? The Bible says no. The Bible says no. Why? Because what if Jesus would have done that? On that cross said, well, they did this to me, all right. Send laser beams down, they're done. He didn't do that. Question two, can I seek justice? So here's the other question. Oh, okay, well, wait a second. Do I just got to forgive and I can never stand up for myself? I'm just a doormat. I let people take advantage of me. How does this work? Well, let's read Luke 6. Again, Jesus is teaching. This is kind of tricky because people read this and they can misunderstand it. So Luke 6, verse 27, Jesus says, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. That's a tough one. And he says, from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Verse 32, if you love those who love you, what benefit is it to you? For even sinners love those who love them. 
Verse 35, but I say love your enemies and do good and lend to expect nothing in return and your reward will be great and you'll be sons of the Most High for He is kind to the ungrateful and evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. So th- this raises the question then, can I not defend myself? Like should David in that cave been like, you know what, hey Saul, I see you using the restroom here. Hope everything's going okay. Um, but I want to let you know we're in the cave. Uh, go ahead, tie us up and kill us, all right? We're here, okay? We're not going to defend ourselves. So turning the other cheek. Is that what that means? No. No, it doesn't because look at 1 Corinthians 6. What was going on at 1 Corinthians 6 is the church, church like us, they were having conflict between each other. Now, obviously, we've never had conflict at this church of any kind, sort of nature, you know, but let's try to get in it. Um, so that believers are having conflict, and they were then suing each other because of that conflict. So the reputation in the city was, look at those Christians. Uh, man, they're always in the courts. They're arguing court. They're all over the place. What's going on? So Paul writes the church, 1 Corinthians 6.1. When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare to go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world, and that the world is to be judged by you? Are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more, then, matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers. We'll pause there. Now the point of that text is Paul is not saying, hey, if you have arguments, just turn the other cheek. Don't pay attention to it. Hey, you know what? You can never try to make something right. It's fine. Just, just turn a blind eye to it. No, what, what, is he, what did he just say in verse 5? Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between brothers? What's he saying? Sometimes you got to settle things. Sometimes you got to seek justice. I've told you this story before. When I was in high school, I went to a youth group. And my buddies and I all had trucks that we had saved up and bought. And we kind of lined them up, thought we were cool, you know? Uh, And so we lined them up. And I remember there's this high school girl that just had got her license too. And she pulls up in her car to park. Um, And her music is blaring. And she's doing this kind of thing, you know, and pulling up. And she totally sideswipes my entire buddy's truck. Just down the whole side. She's like, was that me? You, You know, that moment. Everybody in the youth group saw it. Now, my buddy happened to be one of the worship guys, so he felt like I need to be spiritual. But he also had a crush on the girl, too. Um, So then he goes, and in front of everyone, he's like, you know what? You totally sideswiped my truck, but you know what? I forgive you. It's no big deal. You don't got to pay for it. And I was like, oh, my gosh, he's so spiritual, and he plays guitar, and that whole thing. And I stand over there, and I say to my group of friends, I'm like, you know what? If that were me, I'd make her claim insurance, and she'd fix my truck. Everyone looked at me like I was Satan. You know, like, what's wrong with you? Don't you know Jesus said turn the other cheek? But, but see, the, the point is, is it wouldn't have been wrong, and I'm defending myself like 15 years later here. The point, it would not have been wrong for me to say, hey, let's go through insurance to fix the truck. We have that right to seek justice at times. But you do not have to be a doormat to love your enemy. Sometimes the best thing you can do for your enemy is say, hey, this is harming me, and I think it's harming you too. And I don't want to enable this, right? I think the problem is, is, is we're kind of as a generation now, we're too quick to go to that level of you're abusive. And I'm not saying there aren't abusive people. I'm not saying you haven't been abused. But I'm saying right now we're in a category where anyone who has sin, we say, oh, they're abusive. I got to leave. But the Word of God says we're to seek restoration. And ju- justice in the Bible is not, hey, I'm seeking justice, so get out of my life, go burn, I don't want anything to do with you, you're cut out, right? That's today's idea. No, justice is restoration in the Word of God. Look at this, Galatians 6.1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness Keep watch on yourselves, lest you too be tempted. He's saying, what's the word there? Restore them. Matthew 18, verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. See that saying? The point of it is to gain them back. The point is the word of God is saying, hey, do the work. Don't just write people off. Try to fix the situation. Seek restoration. Fight for it, right? Right? But fight to, to lay down your rights, to build the religion. And that's exactly what David is doing here. He could have killed Saul. He could have done all of it. But instead, what he walks out of the cave, puts himself at risk. He says, Saul, look, you got it wrong. I'm not against you. Let's fix this 
thing. A lot of times we need third parties to help. That's what Matthew 18 is about. How many of you in your relationship, romantic, with your parents, with your grandparents, with your kids, whatever it is, it's gotten so bad that you're so hurt that you just can't, you don't think clearly anymore. And I'm saying this because I've been there before. When you're hurt, it clouds your judgment. And you need to invite some other godly Christian people in to say, hey, can you just sit down with us and talk to us about this thing? Because I'm going to guess when you're really hurt, guess what? You don't see things clearly. That's just a fact. Right? You don't. You don't. And there are two sides to every story. And I'm not saying there's not scenarios where the other person's 100% wrong. That can happen, but that's a rarity usually. Usually you have a percentage. Are you seeking restoration? Are you seeking justice? Uh, and are you bringing other people in that are the good people? David's friends, not the right guys. They weren't seeking the word of God. They're like, just kill them. And there's plenty of people out there that say, just ditch them. They're horrible. They're abusive. Run. But if you have godly people in your life who are going to say, hey, actually, where's your sin? Where's your issue? How can we work on this? How can you be loving? Can you seek justice? Yes. Third question. This one will go quicker. Are there conditions to forgiveness? Are there conditions to forgiveness? I love this one because I think so many of us, we say, I will forgive you if you do A, B, and C. Had that? Yeah, I'll forgive you. You know, you don't, but, but you first need to come here. You first need to do this, and then I will extend grace and forgiveness to you. Now, now it's not wrong to go to someone and say, hey, can we fix this situation? That's not wrong. We just said you can seek justice. But the Word of God says this, which is really hard. Even if they don't fix it, what are you called to do? Forgive. Even when they don't meet the conditions, we are called to forgive. And I think that's one of the most excruciating things you'll ever have to do in your life. Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. How did Jesus forgive you? While you were still a sinner, while you were still an enemy with God, he died and forgave you. The only place in Scripture where forgiveness has a condition on it, the only place is right here, Matthew 6.14. This is the condition, it's not what you think. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. That's the condition. Are you able Now, forgiveness does not mean you have to be best friends. Does not mean... You, some people, you can say, hey, I forgive you, but I need some space for a long time. And we need to separate for a time being. Like, that can still be forgiveness. But you're called and for your own sake. Okay, but here, here's the question. How do we do this? It's extremely hard. And some of you here, you have been battered by people, haven't you? Like in romantic relationships with your parents, some of you, your kids, your daughter-in-law, they had a baby, you fed them sugar on accident, now they're out of your, now you're out of their life. Like there's, there's things that happen and you're hurting, right? I know this. So how do we do this? And I think the key is, is found with what David said. Go back to verse 11. He said, I have not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you. But my hand shall not be against you. Look at what he said there. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you. Sarah and I sometimes watch dating shows. Uh, I do it for her. No, I actually get into it. Um, and and uh, we'll watch these. And the funny thing is on these dating shows, you got these people that they date for like a month or two, and then they decide if they're getting married. You know what I'm talking There's like a thousand versions of it. Uh, anyway, but, but it always amazes me that these people are dating for like a month, right? 30 days, and they're followed with cameras, and they know millions of people are going to watch this. But yet they still become crazy and yell and argue and do all this stuff. And in my mind, I'm always like, you just got to be with them for 30 days. Like, if that were me, I'd be the sweetest, kindest, most gracious, you know, because the world's watching, right? You'd think that would t tame how you act, but it doesn't, which is why it's entertaining. Um, here's the thing, though. With God in your relationship, with the people around you, we often get so defensive and fight our battles because we think it's just me and them, and I've got to defend myself. And if I don't defend myself, no one will. And I've got to stand up and I've got to fight for my rights or I've got to stonewall, I've got to do this thing. The reality is the Word of God says you are never alone. It is never just you and them. There is always a third party, and that is Almighty God. David understood that. He comes out, puts himself at risk, but he doesn't attack Saul because he says, Saul, God will be our judge. God sees, and God is my defender. And see, this is the key here. Because God is not just a third party watching, but the Bible says that he's actually 
in your defense, that he's with you, that he's got your back, that if you know him, you are his child, that he loves, that he embraces, he says, you are mine, and I want to protect you. And if you understand that, that enables you in the moment when someone is wronging you, when someone is saying something that's hurtful, when they're not doing what they should do, when they're mistreating you, in that, instead of you lashing out and saying, I'm going to take this in my hands and fight back, you can say, God, you are my defender. You see all things, and you are a just judge, and I trust you rather than getting revenge. See how that works? So it's an amazing thing, and when David understood this, Psalm 91.1, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Proverbs 20, look at this. Do not say, I will repay evil. That's what we just talked about. Then it gives the key. Do not say, I will repay evil. Wait for the Lord, and He will deliver you. That's the key. In that moment when you want to lash out, or stonewall, or get revenge, or get them back, or steal from the employer because they cut your pay. Whatever it is, in that moment, you can say, God, you see, and I trust, and I will wait on you. It changes everything. David understood that. God is the judge, and can you in your life, can you in your situation, surrender and stop fighting so hard and say, God, I want you to come save the situation. I want you to change me. I'm not going to worry about them. You can change them. You can work on that. I can't do it. But will you change my heart and I surrender to you? Will you fight the battle? I, I, I've done, you know, I've been married almost nine years. And, and, and I'm so thankful for my wife. I'm thankful for my son. God has done amazing things in our marriage and I'm a blessed man. But there were some hard moments in the beginning, uh, a lot of which were my fault. Because I came in with this attitude of, this is how it's going to be, Sarah. This is how we're going to do our budget. This is how we're going to do this. This is how we're going to handle this. And I came in kind of like, well, this is, this is just what it's going to be. And I fought for my rights. You know what it did? Destroyed the marriage. Because here I am trying to be authoritarian. I'm fighting for my rights. You hurt me. You're going to see it. You're going to figure this out. And it brought destruction. The only thing ever works in my marriage is when I follow the word of God and I surrender and I surrender my rights. I say, I'm going to choose love and sacrifice instead of demanding my way. And Sarah understands that too. And as we've both grown in that, it's brought us closer together. And what it is in moments when we're both hurt to try to be in that place of, okay, God, even if they're hurting my feelings, instead of fighting back and saying, you don't talk to me that way, I'm going to defend myself. you got to look up and say, God, you're my defender. I want to not return evil for evil. And I think every relationship you will have, I don't think I'm alone in this. I think all of us, whether it's romantic, whatever it is, that we're called to trust and look to God. As we close this, in your life, you will be wronged by people. It's not... A matter of if, it's when. Some of you have already been there. Can you surrender and give it to Him? And you know, when you do, here's one of the beauties of Scripture. Oftentimes when you do surrender to God and you respond in love, oftentimes it changes the other person. Not all the time. Sometimes it takes a long time. But it happens. And look at what Saul, we're not going to read it, but you know what Saul's response to David was? Okay, I'll stop pursuing you. I see and it softens salt. That's why Proverbs says, a soft answer does what? Turns away wrath. Now, it didn't fix the situation because there was issues later on, but in that moment, David did the right thing, and it worked. I want to read this text. I know we got to close, but I want to read this text. It says this in 1 Peter 2, verse 23, talking about Jesus. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But look at this. It's talking about Jesus on the cross. But he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. So here's Jesus on the cross. Everybody's wronged him. They've abused him. They've tortured him. He's on the cross, totally innocent, up there dying, right? Excruciating pain. And he doesn't call down fire and kill him. Why? What does it say? Because he entrusted himself to who? The Father. That Jesus looked up and said, you see all things and you are good and not my will but yours. Right? That's the key for all of us. In all of your relationships, can you surrender and say, God, have your way. Work in me. And I'll trust you to change them. I surrender my 
right? So a few applications. In your own life, are you sensitive to the Holy Spirit like David was? It says his heart struck him. Is God speaking to your heart this morning and saying, hey, um, you've been fighting this battle for your rights to defend yourself, to be on top, to get your way, and God's saying, hey, it's time to surrender. I want to work on you. I want to work on you. Don't worry about them. I'll worry about them. I'm God, right? It's my desire that people are sanctified. It's my desire that people are changed. But right now, I want you to grow. I want you to grow in patience, compassion, love, sacrificial love, and forgiveness. Can you listen to the Holy Spirit? Maybe for you, some application is you need to pick and choose who your friends are, who your counselors are right now. Because I'm guessing a lot of us have friends that aren't very, they don't give us very good advice. Oh, they did this to you? Well, you should do this to them. And God's saying, hey, maybe, maybe bring somebody else in that's godly, that's not going to be biased, that they're going to they're hold the word of God up and they're going to say, hey, yeah, I know they've wronged you, uh, but how can you respond in love? How can you forgive? Maybe for you, you need to stop justifying your actions this morning. Well, I only do what I did because you don't understand. My, my, my parents, I was abused by them, and, and this is who, that's what happened to me way back. And so that's why I am the way that I am. And that's just it. I'm suspicious. I'm angry. I'm this because my past. And God's saying, hey, I know your past. I'm sovereign. But hey, guess what? I'm the God who brings change and freedom. The old is gone. The new has come. Don't use it as an excuse anymore. Let me free you from the bondage of that sin, the bondage of your past, and let's see change. Don't justify your sin. Maybe for you, you need to forgive. Again, forgiveness does not mean that they're your best friend. It does not mean that you can't go and say, hey, this, this is a problem here. Can we work on this? But regardless of their response, good or bad, you're called to forgive as Christ has forgiven us. And that's really a blessing for you. When you forgive, when you truly forgive and let it go, it's freedom. God wants you to have it because that's what he did for you. That's what he's done for me. So as we go here today, remember the story. A guy using the restroom in a cave. But remember, remember the significance of David not returning evil for evil and entrusting himself to God. It's powerful changes lives, can change your life, can free you of bitterness, can free you of the suffering you're in. Those of you who are married, your marriage would instantly be 50% better if you could get this, if you could surrender to Jesus, if you could start loving. It's a big percentage. Let's pray. Jesus, what a, what, what a story of Saul using the restroom. We we thank you for it. And I just thank you for the obedience of David, that a man who was sensitive to your spirit, sensitive to your word. Lord, I pray that we'd have that same sensitivity. Lord, I pray that as people wrong us, as people do things that are evil, Lord, would we be a light in a dark place? Jesus, would we be able, in those excruciating moments, excruciating moments, would we be able to look up and say, I'm going to entrust this situation to Him who judges justly. God, help me to respond in grace. Help me to respond in love. Help me to be patient, to be kind. Lord, I pray that You change us. I pray for the person in this room that maybe they don't know You, Jesus, that today would be the first day in their life that they say, Jesus, I've got a lot of mess inside. I've, I've been justifying my, my sin and my actions. I've been saying it's my parents' fault or my past's fault. But Jesus, I see I'm responsible. Uh, will you forgive me of that? Will you come into my life? You died on a cross. You rose again. Will you save me? Will you make me a new creation? I believe you're God. I surrender and I repent. Save me. And Jesus, I pray uh, for all of us who are already saved, that you'd give us the power and the strength and your spirit to do this because it's hard. But God, may we be loving and patient. May we be long-suffering. May we be like David in this. That our hearts would break at the thought of doing evil. In your name we pray.